Hello and welcome to another Z Notes Live. Today we'll be learning about Aries and Phenol. Guiding us today is Mr. Fahad. Hi guys, and uh, welcome to another episode of A Level Chemistry at Z Notes Live. And uh, today I'll be guiding you through aromatic compounds, basically benzene and its derivatives. So everything that you need to know. So it's going to be a pretty exciting ride. So let's buckle up and begin. All right. So um, basically in today's lesson, we'll be looking at benzene, right? Uh, the structure of benzene in detail and look at what reactions it participates in what kinds of compounds it forms, how we can name these, and uh, basically how we can derive different useful compounds from benzene, which are also known as arenes or aromatic compounds. So let's get straight into it. Now, aromatic compounds are basically compounds that at least contain one benzene ring. Now, benzene ring is basically uh, consisting of six carbon atoms right and uh, these are bonded in an unsaturated hydrocarbon ring unsaturated uh, you guys may be familiar with this term basically means that you're going to have some double bonds present all right and hydrocarbon obviously means you have carbon and hydrogen present in this ring now this term over here delocalized pi bond electrons now this is new and we will look at exactly what this means a little later, okay? Right. Now, the structure of benzene that was initially devised by a scientist called Kekulé uh, basically has six carbon atoms, and each carbon is bonded to one hydrogen atom. So, for example, you have this carbon atom bonded to one hydrogen. It's bonded to two other carbon atoms. And you can see in this uh, hexagonal ring, that you have alternating single as well as double bonds, right? Now, for each carbon atom, we can see that it is uh, forming three sigma bonds, right? With the three atoms it's bonded to, the hydrogen and the carbons as well, right? It's forming three sigma bonds and it has zero lone pairs. So that means that uh, we're going to have sp2 hybridization right so that is an important thing that you will need to remember okay sp2 hybridization and that means that you're going to have a trigonal planar shape with a bond angle of 120 degrees all right now the thing is that all carbon atoms in this shape have a trigonal planar shape around them and as a result all carbon atoms and all hydrogen atoms lie within the same plane and that's why benzene is an example of a planar molecule, right? Uh, basically, all atoms and all bonds, they lie on the same flat plane, right? It's not a three-dimensional molecule. So that's one uh, special property of benzene. And it's all because of its sp2 hybridization, right, of each carbon atom because it's bonded to three other atoms only, not the maximum of four that it could be, right? Now, the thing is that each um, carbon atom over here is forming a pi bond with another carbon atom. So let's say we have this double bond over here. Now, the pi bond over here that is formed is between two orbitals in the 2p subshell, right? And they overlap sideways and they form a pi bond. Now, this happens for all the uh, double bonds over here. I could draw this in. Now, the thing is that uh, you have alternating single and double bonds. And uh, for the double bonds to form, you have a pi bond forming because of the 2p orbitals that are overlapping sideways. But that's only one side of the p orbital overlapping. For example, um, this p orbital is overlapping this way, right? But uh, what's stopping it from overlapping this way, right? The, the answer is nothing. It will overlap this way. And so what you're going to get as a result is a pi bonding ring, 
okay you get a pi bonding ring where the pi electrons in each pi bond there's two of them right so three pi, uh, pi bonds and two electrons in each is going to give you six pi electrons in benzene right lots of pi so uh, these electrons can move between uh, pairs of carbon atoms right as you can see in these arrows um, for example this pair of pi electrons can move to in between these carbon atoms and uh, this pair of pi electrons can move in between this pair of carbon atoms, right? And so on and so forth. And so uh, basically the pi electrons do not stick to a certain pi bond between two carbon atoms. They can move about within the ring, right? They can change the pair of carbon atoms they're associated with. And so we call this delocalized pi bonding ring, all right? So that's the benzene ring. That's the peculiar thing about benzene. And as a result, um, normally we don't write the structure of benzene with alternating single and double bonds. We just write this as this, right? We have a delocalized pi bonding ring. And the thing is that the carbon-carbon bonds have scientifically been found to have the same bond length and the same bond energy. So that means you cannot have uh, double bonds and single bonds, all carbon-carbon bonds are of the same nature, right? And their lengths tend to be somewhere between that of a single bond and a double bond. And as a result, what happens is that you have carbon-carbon bonds that are single, but with a partial double bond character, all right? So that's what's happening in a benzene ring. So let's look at the chemical reactions. Now, the thing is that this uh, delocalized pi bonding ring, this mouthful of a term that we have just unpacked, this is actually very stable, right? And uh, chemical reactions, because their whole aim is to achieve stability, the reactions of benzene are not going to disturb this ring, right? They're going to keep it intact. But what happens is that the hydrogen atoms that are bonded to each carbon atom, these can be substituted by some atom or group of atoms. And uh, those are the types of reactions that we need to look at. And uh, this is actually going to go by the electrophilic substitution mechanism. Okay. And basically the electrophile that's going to be substituted is the hydrogen ion H plus. The hydrogen atoms leave as H plus and some other positive ion is going to take its place. It could be monatomic, it could be polyatomic. And we're going to see examples of um, just how that works. Right, so first example is uh, halogenation, right? We're going to react benzene with a halogen like chlorine or bromine and that, that is going to give us a halobenzene, right? Chlorobenzene, for example, over here, bromobenzene over here. And uh, we basically carry this reaction out at room temperature and pressure, but we need a catalyst for this. And the catalyst is going to be called a halogen carrier, right? The term that we use for this is halogen carrier. And the halogen carrier is either AlCl3 or FeCl3, that's iron-3 chloride, in the case of if you're adding chlorine. If you're adding bromine, we're going to have AlBr3 or FeBr3, either of those. Okay? Right. Now, how this works is the first step in this mechanism of electrophilic substitution that we're going to be looking at is first the formation of the electrophile. The electrophile in this case is going to be Cl positive. Right? I might be thinking that uh, we've come, only come across Cl negative before, but Cl positive is also possible. And basically what happens is that you have AlCl3 over here and you have chlorine. Now we know that AlCl3 is uh, you know, a covalent compound and the aluminum has a partial positive charge and that induces a temporary dipole on the chlorine molecule, the chlorine-chlorine single bond. This is a temporary dipole. 
And so what happens here is that uh, the partial negative chlorine over here, which is part of the temporary dipole, its lone pair will attack the partial positive aluminium. This is electron deficient, right? Because it only has six electrons in its uh, outer shell rather than the eight that it needs to complete it. So that attack is launched. And as a result, the um, CL-CL single bond will break and this will be heterolytic fission. The partial negative chlorine atom gets both electron pairs. Sorry, both electrons in the bond pair. And so um, what you're going to get as a result is that the partial negative chlorine becomes a Cl negative, right? And that is added to AlCl3, so that becomes AlCl4 with a negative charge. This is AlCl4 over here, right? And it has a negative charge overall because of this chlorine that is now forming a dative covalent bond with the aluminium, right? And what is left behind after the heterolytic fission, once this chlorine uh, over here took both electrons in the bond pair in the CLCL, is going to be Cl positive. That this is your electrophile. This is going to be useful in the reaction later. So this was the first step. Using the catalyst, you have created the electrophile. Now we're going to look at what this electrophile does to the benzene. Right. Now, this uh, delocalized pi bonding ring over here, this is actually electron dense, or we could call this electron rich. Because it's electron dense, it's going to attract the positively charged chlorine, right? The chlorine ion, Cl positive. And we show this using a curly arrow originating from the delocalized pi bonding ring. And one pair of electrons in this ring uh, amongst the pi electrons is going to attack the Cl positive, which is electron deficient. It's an electrophile, right? And what happens then is that one of the carbon atoms over here will be bonded to Cl and hydrogen at the same time. And uh, because one of the uh, pi electron pairs has been used to bond with the chlorine, as a result, um, the benzene ring gets a delocalized positive charge. So we show that as uh, the ring being broken and a positive charge being delocalized, right? So we have a positive charge, which is delocalized over the pi bonding ring. Then what will happen is that uh, in order to neutralize this uh, positive charge, the carbon-hydrogen bond is going to break heterolytically. The carbon is going to get both electrons in the bond pair, and one of those electrons is obviously going to be used to snuff out the positive charge that is delocalized over the benzene ring so that we can get back to you know nice smooth stability so that the um, pi bonding ring that was already stable is not disturbed because if it is disturbed, the whole point of this chemical reaction, which is to achieve stability, is not going to be achieved, right? So this reaction would be useless. So that's what is done, right? You have this heterolytic fission over here of the CH single bond. And so, um, this hydrogen, because it loses both electrons in the bond pair, is going to leave as an H+. So basically what you've done is replaced an H+, with a Cl+, right? Both are positive, both are electron deficient, they're both electrophiles. So one electrophile has been substituted for another, so that's your electrophilic substitution, right? That was step two. Now step three over here is the regeneration of the catalyst, right? Obviously, the catalyst, it does take part in the reaction, if you didn't already know that by now. 
but it is regenerated by the end of the reaction. Now, how is that done? In this case, the H plus that is removed from the benzene ring will react with the AlCl4 negative that we uh, saw in step one. And you get the byproduct, which is HCl of this reaction, and you get your catalyst AlCl3. Okay. And by the way, the species that are um, generated in the middle of the mechanism but are consumed by the end of it, they're called intermediates, right? This H plus is an intermediate from step two and AlCl4 negative is an intermediate from step one. They both react and are consumed to give you the byproduct, HCl, and you get your catalyst. All right, so this was electrophilic substitution and uh, we saw the mechanism in detail uh, when we look at the uh, halogenation of benzene. This can be applied to bromine as well. In that case, you would have AlBr3 as your catalyst rather than AlCl3. The rest remains the same. Right, now the next reaction is uh, between benzene and nitric acid. Now, this is going to produce nitrobenzene. Nitro is this group over here, NO2. And you're going to get water as well. So this reaction takes place at 25 to 60 degrees Celsius. You need to do it under reflux. And you need concentrated sulfuric acid as the catalyst, right? So basically, we have a mixture of concentrated nitric acid and sulfuric acid. And when we react it with benzene, with a little bit of heating, it's going to give you nitrobenzene. So um, a quick look at the uh, mechanism for this. We have nitric acid reacting with sulfuric acid. And uh, uh, what it does is it generates the electrophile, which is NO2 positive. This is called your nitronium ion. And this is going to be replacing the H plus from the benzene ring. And in this case, you get the byproduct of H2O in the first step. And this over here, HSO4 negative, that is derived from sulfuric acid. This is an intermediate. And this H2O is a byproduct of the reaction. Now, in step two, this is where the main stuff happens. Uh, the NO2 positive is uh, attracted to the electron dense benzene ring. And uh, uh, one of the pairs of the pi electrons are going to attack the electron deficient NO2 positive. And uh, one of the carbon atoms is going to form a bond with the electrophile and a hydrogen atom at the same time. Uh, this is over here. And uh, the carbon hydrogen bond is going to break heterolytically. We show this with the curly arrow. And uh, uh, basically the benzene ring has a positive charge delocalized uh, on it. Uh, because of the carbon bonding to the electrophile as well as H at the same time. So the carbon hydrogen single bond breaks heterolytically. The pair of electrons will be transferred to the carbon and one of those will be used to put out the positive charge in the benzene ring that's become delocalized. And so that becomes a neutral stable benzene ring once again. And you will get this product, which is nitrobenzene. And H plus over here is another intermediate. This is going to react over here with the previous intermediate of HSO4 negative. That was from the first step. That's going to regenerate your catalyst, right? Which is sulfuric acid. So this is the three-step mechanism for electrophilic substitution using nitric acid and sulfuric acid catalyst. Right. Now, the next reaction that we're going to be looking at is um, similar, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use benzene and react it with an alkyl chloride. All right. Or you could call it a chloroalkane. So this is an alkyl chloride. 
and uh, this is going to give us an alkyl benzene. Basically, you have a benzene ring with one alkyl group bonded to one of the carbon atoms. And you're going to get HCl as the byproduct. For this, you need AlCl3 catalyst, same as in reaction one, where we had chlorine. The only difference is we're going to have a little more heating involved here, right? So this reaction is known as a friedel crafts alkylation, right? Named after the scientists who discovered this reaction. So the first step is formation of the electrophile R positive, right? This is a carbocation. Right. Let's say, for example, that our alkyl chloride is methyl chloride. Right. So let's say that the R group over here is a CH3. It's a methyl group. So what happens over here is that uh, the RCl bond is going to break uh, heterolytically such that the chlorine gets both electrons because it's partial negative. Right. It's an electronegative atom. The Cl negative bonds to the AlCl3, which is electron deficient. It gives you this intermediate over here, AlCl4 negative. And we get a carbocation. And in this case, we, this will be CH3 positive for the example that I'm doing. All right. Now, this CH3 positive over here, what is happening to it is that, uh, uh, again, a pair of pi electrons for the benzene ring will attack the positive electrophile, which is electron deficient. And one of the carbon atoms is going to bond to both the hydrogen and the electrophile at the same time. And as a result, you're going to get a positive charge that's delocalized over the benzene ring, making it unstable. So the carbon hydrogen single bond will break heterolytically shown by this curly arrow. And so the positive charge is put out and we get a stable benzene ring once again over here uh, with no charges delocalized over it. And the carbon is now bonded to this electrophile, the CH3. And the previous electrophile, which you had H plus, has been substituted. Now, the H plus in step three is going to react with your intermediate from step one, AlCl4 negative. This gives you the byproduct, which is HCl. And you get AlCl3 which is your catalyst that has been regenerated after speeding up this particular reaction. Now, another reaction that we have is uh, Friedel Crafts acylation, right? Now for this, we just need to know what acyl over here means, right? Now, acyl is basically the functional group that contains a carbon oxygen double bond, right? and it contains at least one alkyl group, right? So this over here, this group is your acyl group. Now what we have is an acyl chloride. So this acyl group is bonded to a chlorine atom over here. Okay, that's an acyl chloride. And what it does over here is that uh, one of the hydrogens in benzene is going to be replaced by this RC double bond O group over here. So that's going to be acylation. So once again, uh, this is going to require AlCl3 catalyst and heat, same as in alkylation. So over here, let's say that again, I have the R group as the methyl group, CH3. So over here, I have CH3, COCl. And this reacts with AlCl3. Again, what will happen is that the carbon-chlorine single bond will break heterolytically. And uh, this carbon atom over here will get a positive charge, right? As you can see over here. And the chlorine, which was partial negative, that got both electrons in the bond pair is going to be negative. And a lone pair on this negative chlorine will attack the electron deficient aluminum over here. And so that will give you AlCl4 negative. This is your AlCl4 negative. That is your intermediate once again. And this will feature once again in step three when the catalyst is regenerated. But for now, the hero of the show is your electrophile. 
which is RCO positive. We can call this an acyl cation, all right? Now, we have CH3CO positive um, that is going to be attacked by a pair of pi electrons from the pi bonding ring of benzene. So what happens is one of the carbon atoms is bonded to hydrogen and the electrophile. And well, uh, as a result, we have positive charge that is delocalized over the benzene ring. To put this out, the carbon-hydrogen bond undergoes heterolytic fission. And so the hydrogen leaves as an H+. Plus, and you get no more positive charge delocalized over the benzene ring. That is stable now. And you have SCH3, C double bond O, that is bonded to the benzene ring. And this H plus obviously will react with that intermediate we talked about in step one, and it gives you the catalyst, all right? You might be thinking that a lot of things are repeating themselves, and uh, you're right. It's a pattern that you just have to get used to. And so you can write the three-step mechanism of electrophilic substitution for uh, any um, benzene-derived compound. Right. Now, this is all about the electrophilic substitution. Now, the next thing is to look at the um, other reactions of benzene. All right. In this case, um, what we will do is we will look at uh, not simple benzene, but we're going to look at an alkyl benzene. For example, over here, we have CH3 group that is bonded to a benzene ring. So that is going to be methyl benzene. Now, methyl benzene, methyl benzene is going to react with an oxidizing agent, a very strong oxidizing agent like KMnO4, right? It needs to be hot, it needs to be alkaline, all right? And once it reacts with KMnO4, obviously, we're going to use dilute H2SO4 uh, to ensure that the alkali catalyst does not react with the product of this reaction, which is an acid, right? We want to ensure that the acid does not react with the alkali catalyst. We have benzoic acid that is the product. Basically, the CH3 has been replaced by COOH. Right. And uh, what happens basically is that uh, no matter how long the alkyl side chain is, it's always the first carbon atom that will be converted into a COOH, right? This is the carboxylic acid functional group. And the other carbon atoms over here that are further along the chain, uh, they will be converted into carbon dioxide and water, as you can see over here. So you're always going to get benzoic acid as your organic product. And over here, what's basically happening is you have a benzene ring. And this is bonded to a carbon atom that is further bonded to three methyl groups. Now, remember that the carbon atom that is directly bonded to the benzene ring, this one, has to be oxidized to the carboxylic acid functional group, but that can only happen when that carbon atom that's directly bonded to the benzene ring is further bonded to at least one hydrogen. If it's not bonded to any hydrogens, then there will be no reaction. And over here, just as a more complicated example, uh, what happens basically is that uh, you have two carbon atoms that are directly bonded to the benzene ring. Both of them will be converted into carboxylic acid functional groups. And uh, the remaining carbon atoms that are part of that cyclic chain, basically this and this, these will be converted into CO2 and H2O. So that is what happens. So this is the oxidation of the alkyl side chains of um, alkyl benzenes. And finally, there is one reaction, just when you thought that uh, all the reactions are going to leave the benzene ring, the stable pi bonding ring, undisturbed, 
Well, lo and behold, we have a reaction that has um, harsh enough conditions to actually destroy it, right? And these conditions are basically reacting with hydrogen gas over a platinum or nickel catalyst at this temperature, 150 to 200 degrees Celsius. Same conditions that you would have uh, when uh, hydrogenating an alkene. But an alkene's pi bond isn't that strong. The pi bond in benzene, though, is very stable. So for this, in order to break that um, back, what we're going to do is high pressure. High pressure is going to ensure that the benzene ring, the pi bonding ring, breaks and all the carbon atoms get bonded to two hydrogen atoms instead of just one. And so this final product over here is called cyclohexene. All right, and uh, one other reaction of benzene is that uh, um, we have looked at the halogenation of benzene uh, that required AlCl3 or FeCl3 for the chlorination of benzene, for example. But if we have an alkyl benzene, what we can do, if we want the halogen to uh, substitute a hydrogen atom in that side chain rather than the benzene ring, is... Uh, Instead of the catalyst, the halogen carrier, we can introduce ultraviolet light. Okay. So for example, over here, if we have ultraviolet light and no halogen carrier, um, this alkyl side chain over here is going to get one of its hydrogens at least substituted by a halogen atom. So over here, CH2CH3 becomes CH2CH2Cl. That is one example, right? Uh, any number of hydrogen atoms can be substituted up to the maximum that there are present. But if we have room temperature and pressure and we have AlCl3 catalyst, then what will happen is that the chlorine, instead of targeting the side chain, it's going to target the benzene ring, okay? It's going to target the benzene ring. And so as a result, um, there are a couple of positions that this chlorine atom can take up on this benzene ring other than the one that uh, contains the alkyl side chain. So that's a difference in conditions resulting in a difference in the reaction that takes place, right? The reaction with benzene ring uh, takes place with AlCl3 catalyst. That's electrophilic substitution. And the reaction with ultraviolet light where the side chain is targeted, the alkyl side chain, now that is free radical substitution that you have already covered in AS level. All right. Okay, now um, a small thing about halogenoarenes, right, such as chlorobenzene and bromobenzene, is that the delocalized pi bonding ring extends uh, to include the halogen atom over here. So we know that uh, the halogen atom contains three lone pairs. Now, one of those lone pairs uh, in a p orbital in the correct orientation can overlap partially with the carbon atom that it is bonded to its p orbital in the delocalized pi bonding ring. So this over here is a partial overlap. And this partial overlap causes the carbon-chlorine bond to become very strong. And so as a result, this uh, chlorobenzene or halogenobenzene or halobenzene is going to become unreactive. All right, so let's look at the naming of arenes, right? We've already done enough reactions. So let's look at the naming, all right? Now, You've already seen these compounds over here uh, as products of the reactions that we study. We just uh, use the prefix of the substituent followed by benzene, such as chlorobenzene for, you know, when the benzene ring is bonded to a chlorine atom, bromobenzene, nitrobenzene, methylbenzene, all that kind of stuff we've already done. But the main issue arises when you have two or more substituents. For example, over here, 
you have two nitro groups, one over here and one over here. So what you're going to do is uh, you're going to number the carbon atoms in the benzene ring from one to six. Uh, you could start at either of these two substituents and uh, you could go either uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise. But what you have to ensure is that the sum of the numbers given to the substituents has to be the smallest. For example, if I start at this carbon atom over here, this is number one, and I go clockwise, right? So I will get number one and number three. So this will give us a sum of one plus three, that gives us four. Now, if instead I start at this substituent and I give it number one and I continue clockwise, in this case. Then what happens is I have carbon atom number two, three, four, and five. That's carbon atom number five. That's for the second substituent. So that's going to give me a sum of one plus five equals six. Right? So that's not good enough, right? So we're going to go with these numbers instead. And so what we do is one, three. Those are the numbers for the substituents. Because we have two nitro groups, so this is going to be di nitro and followed by benzene. So that's going to be the name for this compound. All right. Now we have a couple of other examples, right? So for example, over here, we have CH3 and NO2. Now, obviously, um, if you have this carbon atom as number one, so it doesn't make sense to go this way uh, to give this uh, NO2 number six, rather go it for number two over here. So now you have two different substituents. How do you place them in the name? Well, it's preferred to place them in alphabetical order, but uh, even if you don't, it doesn't really matter at your level, right? So you can just write this as one methyl, that's the first substituent, two nitro, because M comes for N, and then you have benzene to complete the name. And then over here, we have another example where we go for the numbering, right? And uh, to make this short and sweet, uh, the numbering that gives us the smallest sum is if I start with C2H5 over here, and I go clockwise. So I get number one and number two, for the chlorine and number four for the nitro group. So this would become, you know, one. Well, if I place them in alphabetical order, the chlorine should come first. So that's going to be two chloro. And then I have the ethyl group. So that's going to be one ethyl. And then I will have a carbon atom number four, the benzene ring, that's going to be nitro. And then I have benzene. So I have three different substituents at three different carbon atoms, and they have to be placed in alphabetical order, and you have to place the correct number in front of them and ensure that the numbers yield the smallest sum. That's how you number the carbon atoms bonded to the substituents. And so naming of ferrides is no easy task, right? The good news is that you will only get ever get one mark questions out of this topic. But still, you should get the hang of how to do this. Right. Now, just when you thought that naming of ferrides would be over, now there are some compounds, some benzene derivatives that uh, have their name not ending in benzene. Okay. For example, if I have an NH2 group, this is not going to be called amino benzene. It's going to be called phenyl amine. Over here, when I have OH, it's called phenol. When I have um, CO2H, you've already seen this example at the oxidation of the side chain. That's going to be benzoic acid. And finally, we have benzaldehyde, right? This is going to be an aldehyde group bonded directly to the benzene ring. Now, when you have substituents over here that are bonded to a benzene derivative that has this kind of special name, then the naming becomes a little simpler, right? What you do is 
you number the carbon atom that is bonded to that substituent, such as OH, as number one. And you ensure that the other substituent gets a number such that the sum of the numbers is the smallest. Now, in this case, if I go clockwise or anti-clockwise, it doesn't make a difference. It's going to go two, three, four, two, three, four, right? So that gives us four. That's the carbon atom bonded to the bromine. So that's bromo. And then I'm going to end this at phenol, right? I'm not going to introduce the number for the OH group because I know that benzene bonded to OH has a special name. That's phenol. So that's going to be my base compound, all right? And then the bromine is going to be the only substituent that I'm considering. And then over here, for example, I have benzoic acid. Um, that is the base compound. Just highlight this over here. And uh, this is going to be carbon atom number one, the carbon that is bonded to the carboxylic acid group. And if I go clockwise, I'm going to get three over here. If I went anti-clockwise, uh, I would get five instead. That would be two, three, four, five. So I would rather go for clockwise. So this is going to be three nitro and then the base name is going to be benzoic acid. All right, I'm not going to be um, looking at giving the number and the name for the CO2H substituent because that's part of the base compound now. Right, so now the last thing that we're going to be looking at is the directing effects of substituents, right? So some substituents are going to be electron donating and some are going to be electron withdrawing, right? And as a result, um, the next substituent that comes in, the second substituent, um, will choose a carbon atom depending on the first substituent and its nature. So we have some electron donating groups. For example, we have R, which is basically an alkyl group, right? And we have OH and we have NH2. These are examples of electron donating groups. These guys have a positive inductive effect on the benzene ring. And so they activate positions two, four, and six, right? If you start counting as uh, uh, the um, carbon atom, which is bonded to the substitute already there, that's carbon atom number one, and you count either clockwise or anti-clockwise, and you determine position two, four, and six, that is going to be the position where the next substitute is going to go because of the electron donating effect of the first substitute that's already there, the alkyl group, the OH, and the NH2. Now, the opposite effect happens with the electron withdrawing groups. They get, these guys have a negative inductive effect. And so these will activate the remaining positions, which are positions three and five. Okay. So if you uh, consider the carbon atom bonded to the first substitute that's already there as number one, then you count clockwise or anti-clockwise, it doesn't really matter. Positions three and five are going to be activated because of the negative inductive effect or electron withdrawing effect of the first substituent. And that's where the second substituent will go at number three and five. So for example, we have carboxylic acid group, the acyl group that we looked at earlier, and the nitro group that are electron withdrawing. Okay, now the good news is that this information will be given to you in the exam, right? Uh, so you don't need to necessarily remember this, but it's still a good idea to take it into account. Right. Now, for example, over here, we have methyl benzene. Now, if this were to be chlorinated, we were to substitute one of the hydrogens in the benzene ring with the chlorine, what will happen? This methyl group is an example of a uh, electron donating group. It has a positive inductive effect. So if this carbon atom bonded to methyl is number one, so we have two, four, and six, these are the carbon atoms at which the chlorine will be bonded. That's the second substituent. So we can have two chloro, one methyl benzene, 
or we can have 4 chloro 1 methyl benzene right now over here there's one important point to note this over here is not going to be called 6 chloro 1 methyl benzene because remember when we're naming we have to target the smallest sum we have to count the carbon atoms in that way that we get the smallest sum for the substituents over here not going to go clockwise now i'm going to go anti clockwise this time and so this is going to be 2 chloro 1 methyl benzene so they are the same the first and the last product okay so two and six positions are equivalent because they're one carbon atom away from the first substituent and so we can have uh, further substitution of chlorine take place if there is excess chlorine gas there's enough catalyst then what will happen is um, you can have two of these positions filled up so you can have uh, two and four or two and six or all three two four and six and that would be trichloro one methyl benzene and this is another example, but this case, what we have is the nitro group, which is electron withdrawing, is going to direct the next substituent, which is a CH3 group, a methyl group, to positions 3 and 5, rather than position 2, 4, and 6, because it has the opposite effect on the benzene ring. All right, so that's enough for uh, benzene and its reactions. Now let's do some past paper questions just to understand what we have gone through right now over here benzene reacts with a compound d that is unknown to us in the presence of a suitable catalyst to give cumene which is over here and non-organic product e this is an electrophilic substitution reaction so we need to name the reactant d and the non-organic product e now remember that in cumene we have an alkyl group. This is an alkyl group. This is a skeletal formula, right? So this is going to be CH3, and this is bonded to a carbon, which is bonded to another CH3, right? Now this carbon is directly bonded to the benzene ring, so we want to come up with the structure for D uh, reactant D, okay? So this carbon is bonded to two CH3 groups. Now, the other two things it's going to be bonded to are obviously going to be a hydrogen that is not shown in the skeletal formula and a chlorine. Because remember, whenever we have an alkyl group bonded to benzene, that means we have an alkyl chloride that was involved. Okay. Now we need to just come up with a name for this. Okay. So the longest carbon chain has three carbon atoms like this. So this is going to be propane. And it's carbon atom number two in the middle that is bonded to the chlorine. So we're going to say that this is two chloropropane. Okay. So two chloropropane is our answer over here if we want to name the reactant D. And the non-organic product E, what happens is that a hydrogen in the benzene ring is substituted by this big alkyl group over here and the hydrogen is going to bond with a the chlorine from the alkyl chloride so this is just going to be hydrogen chloride hcl says give the name of the type of aromatic electrophilic substitution reaction taking place so this is alkylation Right, so this is question is related to cumene again. So we have the structure in front of us. Says it undergoes re substitution reactions with chlorine to give several different isomeric products with the formula C9H11Cl. The substitution can occur in the aromatic ring or in the side chain of cumene, right? So describe the conditions that are used to ensure substitution takes place only in the aromatic ring. Now, in this case, what you're going to do is uh, you're going to ensure that you have AlCl3 catalyst and heat. Then it says, draw the structures of the two major isomeric products of the reaction formula C9H11Cl when the substitution takes place at the aromatic ring. 
So now what we're going to do is first we draw the structure of cumene. Right? And remember that this is an alkyl group over here. This guy over here is an alkyl group. And we know that alkyl groups, we just saw this, this has a positive inductive effect, right? And as a result, it's going to activate positions two, four, and six in the benzene ring. Now, remember that this uh, formula for the product has only one chlorine atom. So it's either going to go to position two or position four. Positions two and six are equivalent. So I'm not going to write position six as a third isomer, right? So it's just going to be two. So I could bond this over here. Or I could draw the structure again. I need to draw two major products. And number four is going to get this CL. All right. So that is your um, answer to this question. Now it says, describe the conditions that are used to ensure substitution takes place only in the side chain. Previously, we looked at the aromatic ring. Now we're going to ensure that the chlorine is going to substitute one of the hydrogens in the side chain, the alkyl side chain. Now for this, you need not ALCL3 catalyst, but you need ultraviolet light. So we need the structures of two isomeric products of the reaction, formula C9H11Cl, right? So now we're not going to touch the benzene ring. We're going to look at the side chain. Now over here, what's going to happen is that the one chlorine atom could either bond to this carbon atom or the carbon atom in the center. If I were to bond it to the third carbon atom, it would be the same as bonding it to the first, right? They would have the same equivalent position. So I'm going to draw these isomers over here. So I have benzene, I have the side chain, and the first carbon atom is bonded to chloride. So I show another bond with a Cl over here. And the next isomer is going to be the carbon that is in the center is going to be bonded to chlorine. So I show it over here. All right. So either the first or the second carbon atom can bond to a chlorine after the substitution of one of its hydrogens by the free radical mechanism for alkanes that you guys have studied in AS level. Right. Now, complete the following table to show the structures of the organic products formed when cumene reacts with each reagent. So now cumene it's first going to react with hot KMnO4. That's an oxidizing agent. And we know that uh, for this reaction to take place, we need a carbon atom that is directly bonded to the benzene ring that has at least one hydrogen bonded to it. And we saw earlier that that is the case. So that carbon atom that is directly bonded to the benzene ring is going to form a carboxylic acid group. And the other carbon atoms over here and over here uh, are going to form just CO2 and H2O. And for hydrogen and nickel catalyst and high pressure, we know that the benzene ring is finally going to break, finally going to break the camel's back. And so what we're going to have is a skeletal formula with no ring, right? We're going to have no benzene ring over here. That's it. That's the, that's the answer. All right. Okay. Now, cumene can be nitrated using a mixture of concentrated nitric and sulfuric acids. So for this reaction, we have already seen that the um, electrophile is going to be the nitronium ion, NO2 positive. And we draw a curly arrow originating from the benzene ring. A pair of pi electrons attacks the electron deficient NO2 positive. And so we show the benzene ring with a delocalized positive charge. So break the ring, place a positive sign. You can place it anywhere within the ring. You don't need to be that specific about it. And uh, 
Now, the carbon atom that's going to be bonded to the nitronium ion and the hydrogen atom at the same time. Now, remember, because again, this is electron donating, this alkyl group that's already present. This is electron donating. So we're going to place the NO2 either at uh, carbon atom number two or number four, right? Uh, now, again, because this question says you do not need to draw the products, so I'm just going to go with carbon atom number two, right? So we have a hydrogen and we have an NO2. And the carbon-hydrogen bond is going to go heterolytic fission. We draw a curly arrow from the hydrogen to the benzene ring. All right, from the carbon hydrogen single bond to the benzene ring to put out that positive charge to make it stable once again. Right now, over here we have a little complex question. It says benzophenone can be synthesized in two steps from bromomethyl benzene. So, this is bromomethyl benzene, right? Uh, now this is going to give us an intermediate compound L with the formula C13H12. And that is going to react with KMnO4 and heat to give us benzophenone. All right. So now I'm going to answer the easier question first. Step four, the last part that you can see over here, part three, says deduce the type of reaction in step four. Obviously, because you have KMnO4 over here. Right, that is going to be an oxidation reaction that takes place. Now we need to deduce the identity of compound L. All right. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is first let's count the number of carbon and hydrogen atoms in ben bromomethyl benzene. That's the reactant. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right. So we have seven carbon atoms. And how many hydrogens are there? It's going to be one, two, three, four, five. Uh, there's not going to be any hydrogens bonded to this one. So that's five. And two are going to be over here. So that's going to be uh, C7H7, right? C7H7. Okay. Now, the next thing that uh, we need to look at is how many other carbons and hydrogens are going to be added. So if we subtract this from L, right, we're going to get C. So 13 minus 7 gives us 6, and uh, 12 minus 7 is going to give us 5. So that basically means that you're going to get rid of the bromine over here, and you're going to bond it to a benzene ring. This is a benzene ring over here. With one hydrogen missing, of course because one of the carbon atoms needs to bond to the rest of whatever this is. So this was a simple method to look at it. So we have a benzene ring over here. We have a carbon atom in the middle, and this bonds to another benzene ring. So that's going to be the structure of L. Now, um, as far as the mechanism of step three and the reagent conditions are concerned, now guys, bromomethyl benzene this bromine atom is at the end of a carbon chain. So this is an example of a, an alkyl halide, right? You have a halogen atom at the end of a carbon chain, so that's an alkyl halide. Doesn't matter if it has a benzene ring at the other end of the chain, right? You have a halogen atom bonded to an alkyl group, which is basically uh, the methyl benzene part. And so... If you're reacting another benzene molecule with an alkyl halide, that's going to give you an al uh, basically an alkylation reaction, right? So step three is going to be an alkylation reaction. You're getting this big alkyl group over here that is bonded to the benzene over here. This is an alkyl group. This is alkylation going on. An alkylation, as we all know, this is going to be electrophilic substitution reaction. And the reagents and conditions for this. Well, the condition for this reaction is uh, going to be uh, AlBr3 because this is a, you know, alkyl bromide, not chloride. 
and you're going to require some heat. That's the conditions, right? And the reagent that is involved is the other benzene that we just brought in, right? These are the conditions. And the reagent is your benzene, the other reactant in this whole process. All right, so that was a pretty long discussion on uh, arenes. We talked about benzene, its reactions, the naming, uh, and we looked at quite a few detailed past paper questions that summed up the whole topic. Uh, so uh, if you've got to this point, congratulations, you have completed a very important chapter in your A2 level organic chemistry syllabus. All right, that's it from my side. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Thank you, Mr. Fahad, and thank you everyone for watching. We will see you in the next episode of Xenots Live.